Welcome to the Profit Triangle. This is part one. What is a prophet? This is the first of our series on lectures on priesthood. And we're going to begin with sort of a series within a series. And that is the principle of prophets and or the Profit Triangle. And the idea here is, is that we're going to lay a really, really, hopefully comprehensive framework about prophets that will be very, very, very helpful understanding all of the next topics we're going to cover through. So today, I am really excited to bring on Kristen, who will be joining with us during this presentation. Kristen, I've known for a long time because she happens to be my cousin. And <laughs> we, we've been down this faith journey for many years together, and we've had a lot of conversations. So welcome to this presentation, Kristen. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, so I'm I'm excited because you haven't seen this and you know, this isn't something that's rehearsed or practiced except mm -hmm. for that fact that we just showed you two slides and we realized it wasn't recording. But um, <laughs> so we had to back up a little bit. Um but we're I'm really glad to, to go through this with you because you know, you and I uh, we've we've talked through a lot of questions and we've we are seeking faith and to increase faith and not only just our own personal faith, but faith in God's revealed structures, which are really, really important. And to know how to relate to those structures and mainly the prophet question is really, really critical. And someone might see this might even say like, well, what do you mean the prophet question? Well, the idea of a triangle, if you haven't seen uh, our first video is that oftentimes we learn something that is very, very helpful and it's true, and it's in the first iteration that you learn it. But if you don't allow that principle to expand, uh, the principle that you learn initially could 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 also become a big stumbling block if you don't understand the principle as it's fully under uh, fully truthful. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I'm not actually saying it very well. But the idea of a profit triangle is is that the principle of profits is extremely extraordinarily important. It's extraordinarily powerful. In fact, so powerful that perhaps at the core of most of people's faith experiences, religious experience and faith trials or faith struggles is the question of profits. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that, Kristen? Like, don't you yeah. feel like this is the core? <laughs> yeah. Like at, as you're talking, I'm thinking about, and I'm sure viewers can relate I had so many friends uh, really struggle with the church recently and some have even left. And I think this is at the core of that principle. And it's kind of the trump card. Like if you have a question uh, or you're struggling with your faith, I mean, I think we can all relate that everyone's answer is just, you know, follow the prophet. Like just go look at what the brethren say. But if you're really struggling with, with um, your view or your triangle of this, it can it can shatter your testimony, you know, or you just don't know yeah. where to turn. And so I feel like this is the, the triangle. It seems really relevant that this would be the beginning. Yeah. Like when you say it's the triangle and I, 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 I agree. And at the core of it, it's probably because there's lots of questions around it. There's actually lots of triangles in this, around this entire topic. And mm -hmm. so Obviously, this isn't going to capture all of them, but hopefully this sort of captures the, some of the core categories that we're going to address. And so things like um, the president of the church is the prophet. Is, is he the prophet? Um, and what does that exactly mean? And how should, we, how should we relate to the president of the church as the prophet? And we're going to unpack a lot there that I believe will truly enhance people's faith and their ability to both discern and sustain. And that's going to be really, really critical. But I invite the listener of this series to, to go through the whole series in succession, because we're going to lay a lot of found work, uh, a groundwork that's going to help us actually answer those questions around that. So we're going to just throw it out there, knowing that we're going to be building towards this question of president of the church and being a prophet. Can the brethren lead us astray? I mean, isn't this not at the core of, of, you know, you get on any gospel, LDS gospel, Facebook group, and this question comes up every other day and has epic fights, epic mm -hmm. battles, epic debates. 
And it to understand the meaning of this, I think maybe one of the single most core things that we could accomplish or at least drive towards in this in this um, project. Is there only one prophet on earth? And that's that's pretty assumptive with a lot of people, but we have to really back out of that and, and think through that and talk about that because that's going to be one of the core things we're going to discuss first. And then I have my slides out of order a little bit. Follow the prophet. What does that mean? And how do you follow a prophet? And what are the principles around that? What are the warnings around that? How does that increase faith? And how can that principle be distorted in a way that it doesn't increase faith? Mm. So that's going to be, that's going to be a big, a big triangle to, to tackle, right? Yeah. So, I think the last three years, that's been a, a real big theme, at least in a lot of my meetings is the, the follow the prophet and, uh, you know, put an exclamation point behind that, not a question mark. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you get some mixed messaging, like, like, um, you know, of, of course, of course, we can make mistakes and, and we can, you know, not always talk as prophets, but then you're, then you're, like you said, you're invited to always put exclamation marks instead of question yeah, marks. Yeah, I think that's been my biggest um, confusing thing is that, you know, in one sentence, I'm told that, um, that they're still human and they're fallible, which, which I'm like, okay, you know, like that, that makes sense. Like that feels scriptural. And then the next sentence will be, they speak for God, who is obviously perfect, perfect and infallible. And so it's just a very con confusing and conflicting, at least for me. I mean, I hope I'm not alone. It's super confusing and conflicting and, and it's been a struggle. Um, you know, I'm, I still consider myself very faithful and active, but this has been one of my big questions of, well, wh which is it? And is it okay to ever question what is said? Or, or if you have personal conflict with what is said, is that, is that okay? Yeah, that's, that's a sensitive topic, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you bring this up with people and very few things get people more animated or emotional or, or sensitive than this question. And doesn't that speak or angry to how, or, or angry yeah <laughs> or make you nervous and yeah. doesn't that speak to how important it is like it's really critical that we understand this and i believe that the truth never disappoints and as we really drive towards clarity and drive towards the truth of all these principles that it will build out a structure that will really really increase faith in christ faith in the truth and also in faith in God's revealed covenant structures, which we're going to talk a lot about. So this, the, the intent of this is to really, really help people understand how they can to resolve these questions in a way that doesn't undermine their faith in true things. So I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, but yeah. Well, I'm really I think... excited about it. I think both of our goal is it's like we want to see more and more people stay, like stay in the faith and stay in the yes. covenant and in the gospel. So that's why I love this, that we've got to address these core questions that, that really make people leave before, before they discover the truth and the light. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's tackle this from the beginning. So, <clears throat> excuse me. We're going to get to all of these questions. It might, it, it's going to take a little bit of time and, and groundwork to build. So we're going to go as fast as we can. That makes sense. But if we don't actually lay a groundwork in the right way, we really can't answer or address some of these core, core questions. So we have to start a little bit from the beginning and we're going to invite the viewer to really to bear with us um, because I hope that every aspect of this presentation is, is helpful actually. And, and so, but we're going to start with what is a prophet? And, you know, this isn't as obvious maybe as we, we would hope, because perhaps one of the first answers someone might say, well, a prophet is the, the, the president of the church, God's prophet on earth. And the whole gospel sort of hangs on this singular um, 
principle that we have a prophet, it's God's prophet, and this is where both our authority and the truthfulness of the gospel all hangs. And so we actually have to unpack this quite a bit because it's not untruthful, but it's a triangle. And if we don't understand the core principle of what a prophet is, then we're going to we're going to get caught in the weeds really really quickly and we're not going to be able to actually increase faith and so we're going to have problems really quickly and so you know you and i grew up in seminary we grew up knowing and memorizing this scripture surely the lord god will do nothing but he revealed his secret unto his servants the prophets and so understanding this who are the prophets that he reveals his secrets to are, are they a core group that he will only interact with at a very, very fundamental high level? Or is the intent of the Lord to be able to reveal all of his secrets to all of his children? That's the core principle we're going to address early. So what is a prophet, Kristen? That's the great question. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> Yeah. What is a prophet? Uh, nothing will get people's heart rates going faster than this, right? Oh, yeah. And so as we kind of said before, I hope the listener bears with us as we sort of build these principles out, because we're going to be able to address a lot of, of questions um, that really try people's faith sometimes. So what is a prophet? Let's start in the most basic, basic a way of looking at this question. And it is something like anybody who has a divine encounter. So if you're a person and the Lord speaks to you in some way or reveals to you, or you experience the divine, you experience heaven in some dimension that you both obtain that experience and you share that experience in the appropriate way. And when you do that, share that experience, what it does is it invites other people to have a similar type of encounter or witness and you become sort of a pattern in, in a dimension of how to obtain that experience. So we have these divine encounters in different ways, and depending upon the way that we hear the voice of the Lord and experience the Lord. Oftentimes, those encounters are just spiritual witnesses in the sense of like you read the scriptures and you, you, you feel the spirit testify of them, or you're in church and you hear a talk and something happens and it really, it, it, it nestles within your soul and you have a, um, a divine encounter with a truth. Sometimes they can happen in dreams. That's a very, very common way that the Lord can communicate with us and we can experience him. Some people even have visions, which is kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? Because people, I think, get really um, anxious about this and maybe sometimes for good reason, but this is a very, very powerful way that the Lord interacts with his children and even physical witnesses, which is um, we're going to talk a lot about this uh, eventually, but the physical witness is the type of witness that brings people into a fullness of the experience of the Lord. So at its core, though, what is a prophet? It's a gift of the spirit. And this is um, laid out in the scriptures really, really clearly. And we don't always think about a prophet being someone that has a gift of the spirit, we think of a prophet as a person or a role or a station that has some sort of formal call to it. And even though the president of the church has a formal calling in the priesthood called, um, he's the presiding high priest, of the, being a prophet is actually just the possession of a gift of the spirit. DNC 46, barely I say unto you, I would that you should always remember and always retain in your minds what those gifts are that are given unto the church and to others it is given to prophesy. My little guy keeps shifting. And again, I exhort you, my brethren, this is in Moroni, I exhort you, my brethren, that ye deny not the gifts of God, for they are many and they come from the same God. And there are different ways that these gifts are administered, but it is the same God who worketh all in all, and they are given to, by the manifestations of the Spirit of God unto men to profit them. And again to another, that he may prophesy concerning all things. Don't you think it's interesting that this is in the, 
that this is within the context of spiritual gifts, which we very, very firmly believe, right, in, in the core of the church, in the core of our spiritual experience is that we all get gifts. And yeah, and I keep, a thinking, is core, I keep yeah. thinking that God is, like, not a respecter of persons. You know, like, that's been also taught to me since early childhood, you know, that he gives his gifts freely to all of his children. So I love that. Oh, that's so good. That's, that's perfect. He is no respecter of persons. And the gift of prophecy certainly isn't that as well. In fact, so much so that we're going to explore why it's critical to understand exactly why it's a gift of the spirit and what type of blessing that can bring to us if we understand that better. Oops, and all these gifts come by the Spirit of Christ, and they come unto every man severally according as he will. Okay, so, you know, the gift of prophecy is not located or isolated in a priesthood calling, even though the gift of prophecy is core to certain priesthood callings. Does that make sense? We'll yeah. explore it more, but, but that's a really key thing to understand. I hate my slides. They're so goofy. They keep shifting around on me, but I'm not going to fix them. Okay. This is a fantastic scripture that should be very, very familiar with us. This is a prophecy from Joel 2. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. This is mm. such a powerful prophecy. Uh, it's quoted in the New Testament. But also, interestingly enough, it is what Moroni quotes to Joseph Smith in his visitation to Joseph. This is from oh church, the church history. Isn't that great? Yeah. He also quoted the second chapter of Joel. From the 28th verse to the last, he also said that this was not yet fulfilled, but was soon to be. And he further stated that the fullness of the Gentiles was soon to come in. Isn't that great? Yeah, this is the stuff that gets me excited about the gospel. I just love this. Yeah. It's so awesome. <laughs> it's so great. So let's explore, you know, some perspectives of, of what this looks like. Okay, now we're going to introduce some principles and some concepts using some scriptural language that, that is really, really core. And not only one of the reasons is, is because Joseph Smith relies on this so much, and it's going to help us unpack a lot. This is from Revelation. Um, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So now we have this really core term and, you know, Kristen, you've heard this probably referenced or referred to, I, I mm -hmm. would imagine the testimony of Jesus. You, you'll see it pop up in scriptures, especially like DNC 76. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so we have to unpack what it means to have the testimony of Jesus. And we're going to like sort of lay out a model of what that could look like, because on its face, it looks like something well, you have a testimony because that's the term we use in the church. And we all mm -hmm. kind of think we know what a testimony is, right? Like you pray about something and the spirit says, yeah, that's true. And that's the testimony of Jesus. But it's actually quite a lot more to it than just that. Well, the thing that comes to my mind is maybe it's like special witness of Jesus. And then in my mind, it jumps to, well, can we all become special witnesses of Jesus? I would think so based on scriptures, right? Amen. Yeah, that we're totally going to drive towards understanding that that's true and, and how that's true. So, but Kristen, we're going to start in a place that might be unusual. And when I think we unpack it, it won't be unusual, but it's going to be the temple endowment. Mm -hmm. So to kind of zoom out just a little bit, we're going to use the temple endowment because, because the temple gives us a pattern and a structure that is extraordinarily helpful to understanding almost every gospel principle. So we're going to kind of lay this out. And as we lay it out, it's going to make a lot more sense. 
of how we understand everything from the testimony of Jesus to faith, to repentance, to priesthood, to prophets, everything. So if the listener will, will bear with me a little bit, uh, we'll go through this. And I think it's going to create a structure that we can understand a lot of things very, very, very powerfully through. So let's, let's start with the endowment. How does that sound? Yeah. Love it. So to very quickly capture some core aspects of the endowment, we start with the tree of life and we start with Adam and Eve at the tree. They're cut off from the presence of the Lord in this, um, in this structure. We, we know that this is archetypical. This is, we are all to consider ourselves as Adam and Eve. We all and this is are, when they like are in the lone and dreary world, right? They're, they're cut yeah, off. Yeah, they get cut off okay. and they go to the lone and, wilder, lone and dreary world, which means in essence that they were veiled from the tree of life, right? Like okay. cherubim and a flaming sword was put on there so they couldn't partake of the fruit. They're veiled in this state. We are all veiled in this state. And in this state, mm-hmm. we call a telestial kingdom. And mm-hmm. what's interesting about the endowment is it actually sets up two veils so to speak or a structure in between the celestial world and the celestial world and that is a terrestrial world now as we introduce this this is why the endowment is so helpful because normally we think of we think of celestial terrestrial and and telestial as these like end state kingdoms that you get in judgment and you get sent to right? Mm, mm-hmm. like you go to the celestial kingdom. You go plan to of a salvation. Uh-huh. Yeah. The plan of salvation, right? Well, what the endowment does is it sets up a way for us to understand this ascension process of being in a celestial world, traversing through a terrestrial world and into a celestial world. Now, if you're wondering what on earth does this have to do with prophets? Bear with me because this is going to be extremely helpful for us to understand this principle. What the temple endowment gives us a way, not a way, it's the principle of truth of understanding that these three worlds are actually covenantal conditions of being. Now, well, and isn't it just like bit... an increase of light too? Like you're increasing in light, just like in the temple, right? Absolutely. Because okay. that's like how you're being, the condition of your being changes, right? It's, it's okay. your, your yes. ability to, to receive and embody light. More and more light until the perfect day. Like you're just increasing in light. Okay. Yes, exactly. And so what we need to understand is we, this receiving of light, like you say, is a, um, is a process or a path we go through. We move through and the endowment is marking those structures out for us to understand. And once we map it that way, it's very, very powerful and it really helps us understand prophets. So we go through this process in, in increasing in light, like you said, Kristen, which is perfect in our conditions of being. So just like you said, you know, we receive the light of Christ in this celestial world. As we fully yield to all of the light presented to us, and we don't put um restrictions on our desire to obey that light it's one way of talking about it we mm-hmm. can become baptized by fire in the holy ghost and we're going to unpack that a lot later but that is what it means to move into a terrestrial world we come born again um another way we talk about this is the first comforter and this type of experience or spiritual rebirth is extraordinarily powerful and understanding those principles of of how to obtain that type of miraculous blessing and how it maps us along our ascension process back into the presence of the Lord is really, really critical. We're going to talk about it a lot more than we're just kind of presenting here. Mm -hmm. So now we traverse through a terrestrial kingdom, and this is where we get the the principles of a straight and narrow path and a rod of iron in the scriptures. So very quickly, we're going to understand that the endowment maps to Lehi and Nephi's dreams. <clears throat> it also maps to second Nephi 31, where the Lord, we're not Lord, the Nephi is actually giving us the doctrinal understanding of 
his dreams and his father's dreams. And the endowment maps to it as well. We're going to be talking about this a ton throughout the entire series, but we're going to first sort of introduce it here. So as you traverse the straight and narrow path, the rod of iron, you come into the celestial world, which is what we would call um, our, making our calling and election uh, sure. It's also called the second comforter is, is an experience or a type of calling and election that happens in this structure. We're going to put out a lot of terms here. They all have very specific meaning and Maybe we're reducing this a little bit simply. We're maybe oversimplifying this a little bit, but we're at least outlining a structure that'll be very, very, very helpful. So Todd, is like the temple endowment kind of just the doctrine of Christ? Are you putting those together or? 100%. Okay, okay. I've never (laughs) thought of it like that, gotcha. Yeah, 100% it is. And we'll, we'll actually talk about this in future videos. This is actually one of the problems we have, Kristen, doing this is that Because the gospel is so expansive in every direction that having a starting point is very, very hard because any starting point is going to preclude a lot of other starting points that you need to have at the same time. (laughs) So totally, it's really, really hard. (laughs) I love that connection though. That's really cool. Well, what I love about the gospel though, is it all connects like everything. It just starts to become a lot more simple um yeah which which i guess is the doctrine of christ right it's like so simple yet complex but it it really just all ties together awesome yeah exactly it's so good but yeah you're 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 exactly right the temple endowment is the doctrine of christ okay okay and when we can map that on top of each other boy it really starts to unpack a lot we learn so much from the endowment it's so core so um but back to kind of sort of this relating to prophets, we get introduced to this um, principle we're going to talk about. The more sure word of prophecy is associated with the calling and election made sure. And we're going to talk about that, but that's a um, okay. portion of that condition of being. And then this is also means to be sealed. Uh, and I keep saying this over and over, we're going to talk about that too. But so now that we kind of like have established this model from which to talk about, let's talk about the testimony of Jesus, because I think about every single principle of the gospel can be talked about with this model. I, I've yet to find something that doesn't fit like really well and, and illuminates the gospel. Understanding from these three structures of conditions of being. And so let's do the testimony of Jesus. And so when we say this, you know, the obvious one is a testimony, right? I, I, I venture to, to maybe think that most of your life when you've heard the term testimony of Jesus, that's maybe what you probably thought of, right? Or no. Yeah, <laughs> you, I, I know this church is true. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. It, yeah, Mormon's true and Joseph Smith's mm-hmm. a prophet, and et cetera, et cetera, right? It's the testimony yeah. that you obtain, which is 100% true, but there's also many, many dimensions to it. So. This is what we get when Ronai says, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. It's a very, very um, critical starting point of testimony that we need to have. But Yeah, and sometimes that scripture has been used so much that, I mean, just seeing it on the screen right now, that's like such a powerful line. But sometimes when we've used it repetitively, I don't think about the power of that, but um, we can know the truth of all things. God is truth. He loves to teach us truth in all things. So it's awesome. Yeah, it's so good. And there's having this type of testimony is critical to salvation, but it's not salvific in and of itself. Meaning a testimony can't save you. It puts you or orients you in the path of salvation. Meaning like you can receive a testimony and it can damn you as much as it saves you if you don't mm. move through it. And this is actually what Joseph Smith was referring to in this very, very famous quote from him. And the reason why it's famous is, as far as I can tell, pretty much our entire doctrinal understanding of the gift of the Holy Ghost is derived from this singular quote. Um, so it's something that we're going to have to talk about quite a bit throughout all of the presentations, but we're going to introduce it here. 
to make one singular point because Joseph Smith is making this this distinction between the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost. And one way of saying this is the distinction between testimony and becoming born again. And, you know, he says there's a difference between the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost. He brings up Cornelius that he received the Holy Ghost before he was baptized, which was the convincing power of God unto him of the truth of the gospel. And that's the telestial level of testimony. But he could not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost until after he was baptized. And that's moving through the gate to become born again. And then he um, had not taken the sign or ordinance upon him. The Holy Ghost, which convinced him of the truth of God, would have left him. So what that really is laying out is that if you have a testimony and you don't go on and repent and receive the next level of testimony, then the spirit of that initial testimony will bleed off or will be removed from you. Like if you don't act on the truth that God gave you, you don't obtain, you don't, you don't just retain that truth in at the same level or degree in, in continuity. Does, does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's this constant principle of roller skating uphill. But if you don't continue in forward movement, leaning into and obeying the things that God gives you, they actually retract and they, and you lose them over time, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly over time. Well, so what's the next like, level? Go ahead. Well, yeah. I was just going to say like baptism, how it's, you're burying your old self, like killing off your old self and being born again is essentially what it is. Is like, if you're just like, oh, I, I felt the Holy Ghost as I read the scripture or I felt as the missionaries taught me, well, that was, you felt the Holy Ghost, but in order to really receive it, you have to become a new creature in Christ, correct? Like, yes. Be buried, yes. like your old self dies. Yes. It's, that's a really, really good articulation of that principle. And that's exactly right. And so if you don't move from testimony into that, fully repenting of your sins, because that testimony led you to that place and going through that that death and rebirth, you don't move into this terrestrial structure, so to speak. Um, we're going we're gonna to unpack that a lot in other presentations. But we want to point out immediately, though, is that when you do have that born-again experience, when you do receive the remission of your sins, that's a testimony from the Lord that you have that. And one of the places that that's most brought out clearly is with Enos in the Book of Mormon. I will tell you of the wrestle which I had before God before I received the remission of my sins. And I, Enos, knew that God could not lie, wherefore my guilt was swept away. So Enos receives a testimony of the remission of his sins. And that testimony comes through the spiritual manifestation of, of understanding that you are clean before God and that he forgives all of your sins and that you are rebirthed into a spiritual state. And this testimony is extraordinarily powerful because when you give this testimony, it gives people power to also obtain the same thing. It's referred mm -hmm. to in DNC 76, where we get a lot of mentions of the testimony of Jesus. It says, who received not the testimony of Jesus in the flesh, but afterwards received it. These are they who are honorable men of the earth who are blinded by the craftiness of men. One way of thinking about this is that mm -hmm. you have the honorable of the earth, people who follow light and desired light, but perhaps were never or were, were kept from the knowledge that they could have the full and complete remission of their sins and how to repent in that way so that after they died and they received the truth of the gospel, it actually enabled them to move into this structure and exercise faith in something that gave them the testimony of Jesus that all of their sins were forgiven. Mm. And I think that's really powerful. And this testimony is, I think, something that if we really thought about more, that when we gave it, we're going to we're going to see that this would produce a lot of faith in people to obtain, to seek out the same witness that they have the remission of their sins. This is the same witness that we get from Alma. Now, the context of this is Alma, you know, he, he encounters um, 
to the angel and he is or the Lord and he passes out for three days. Mm -hmm. He almost dies. This is his repentance. And when he comes back, he immediately teaches this, which is interesting because it's on the front end of his experience. It's the front end of his ministry. It's the first thing he encounters. One of the, one of the greatest highlights of the Book of Mormon is this moment when he teaches, I have repented of my sins and have been redeemed of the Lord, for behold, I am born of the Spirit. And the Lord said unto me, marvel not that all mankind, yea, men and women, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people must be born again. Yea, born of God, changed from their carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God, becoming his sons and daughters. And thus they become the new creatures. And unless they do this, they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. What's powerful about this is when this event happens. This is not the end of his life. This is not the end of his journey. This is the beginning of his journey. And he produces this witness to the people. And it's this witness that he takes in his ministry that enables him to bring so many into the, into the fold of truth that he can give this type of, of witness. So Alma the Younger becomes extraordinarily powerful as a prophet because of this level of testimony of Jesus. The third general category is the testimony of your own exaltation of your own salvation. Uh, this is another way of saying your calling and election made sure. And this is a testimony of Jesus that is talked about a lot by Joseph Smith and in the scriptures. So but again, back to DNC 76, this is those who are in the celestial kingdom or the celestial covenant structure. They are they who receive the testimony of Jesus and who overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. They are they who are the church of the firstborn. So this testimony of Jesus is the testimony from Christ that you have a place with him in heaven, that you are sealed up to eternal life. There's lots of examples in this in the scriptures that's all over. But we have to, uh, one important connection we have to make is that this is the Holy Spirit of promise. And we're going to, I keep saying this over and over. We're going to be talking about what that is a lot, but I want to just point that out from the beginning, that that Holy Spirit of promise is the testimony of Jesus. Okay, we're going to read a, Joseph Smith on this very point. Now, this is a little bit hard because this actual quote you're reading is actually how it's recorded. So you're going to see some like weird ways that, you know, weird ways that's kind of formulated in terms of how it's written. But let's follow along here real quick. The first chapter, second epistle of Peter. So second Peter chapter one, he's giving a little exegesis on it. He's explaining it because Peter's talking about the calling and election made sure in this. The first four verses are the preface to the whole subject. This is Joseph Smith talking. There are three grand keys to unlock the whole subject. First, what is the knowledge of God? Second, what is it to make our calling and election sure? Third and last is how to make our calling and election sure. And it is to obtain a promise from God for myself that I shall have eternal life. That is the more sure word of prophecy. So we have that connection, right? Mm -hmm. Peter was writing to those of like precious faith with them, the apostles. So he's, Joseph's explaining that Peter is explaining, he's, he's writing to those who have the same faith and experiences, faith as the apostles did. So then he teaches first to be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is the testimony of Jesus. Second, how is he to get that Holy Spirit? And he says, Expect, except a man be born, he, um, again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Second, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So what is it for a man to obtain salvation? It is a triumph over every foe or ascend far above all enemies for the last enemy to conquer is death. And, to, and until that is done, you have not obtained salvation. So he's, he's connecting a, a number of things very, very quickly. The sure word of prophecy the Holy Spirit of promise, the testimony of Jesus, and the principle that is to obtain a promise from God that you shall have eternal life. And why is this critical? Is this some sort of like just weird, like mystery that people get caught up in? No, it's the aim and the desire for the fullness of the gospel, for the full blessings that are being presented in this life. 
it is the purpose of the endowment. It is the end of the path. It is the tree of life. It's the, the end of the straight and narrow path. It's what's at the end of the iron rod. And even in our, in our revealed scripture, DNC 131, it connects that the more sure word of prophecy means a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the priesthood. So do you see how all of these things are tied together very, very tightly when we yeah, understand all, all of it, right? Yeah, I just love it. It's just, I feel like God works in such a beautiful way and teaches in such a beautiful way because it all, again, it all connects. Like once you start seeing this, you start seeing it everywhere in scripture. It is scripture, like this whole um, teaching over and over again. Yeah, over and over and over. The pattern is not just found in one little isolated place. Mm -hmm. Once you once you kind of know what the pattern is, and you can you can combine the endowment with the DNC, with the Book of Mormon, with the words Joseph Smith taught, with Lehi's dream. Like I love that, you know, that it's yeah. all there over and over again. Yeah, like people well, all the time. I hear it all the time. Like, why would you even be concerned about how, making your calling and election sure? It's not something that's core or required or or even can be like a deterrent to real faith boy if we don't understand what's really going on like that is so that is that is just not helpful it's not true um well and it was taught so much in the early church and we've like lost that teaching for whatever reason not lo yeah. well yeah lost that teaching it's still our doctrine but we just don't teach it so i would say there's a lot of members that haven't even ever really heard it especially yeah. our younger members. So, and I think we we've, we've lost it because we don't know how to like, think about it. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. fit into our model of salvation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, or like what we would call quote unquote necessary. But when we understand what's what the endowment is saying and what the scriptural record is, is really well, and testifying to us. It's different. How many of us go to the temple and have no idea what it even means. Like we just fit through it and it just, doesn't really mean anything but when you can connect it to scripture and connect it to like life and what our purpose here in life is i mean the temple becomes like exhilarating becomes amazing and oh and then, so much so yeah and then you're going to have a temple experience reading about lehi's dream or reading the doctrine of christ so all, all these connections you can have a endowment experience so it's awesome Absolutely. And it's such a powerful connection to make, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And again, so we sorry, have... it's like God is no oh. respecter of persons. So it's like, you know, just this is, if you just keep thinking of that, this is what he's inviting all of us to do. And he's yes. the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he invited the old saints to do, he continues to invite us to do. Like we can have. And Alma the Younger experience, Brother of Jared experience, like all of it. Absolutely. In fact, when you read Ether 4, Moroni says that about the Brother of Jared. He says, all of you who come to me, come to the Lord in the way that the Brother of Jared did, will have these experiences. And it's not just for like, like, and I think this is what you're pointing to. It's not just for like the spiritual elite or mm -hmm. those who are called to certain priesthood offices. This is the general invitation of the fullness of the gospel to everyone. and. Because it's the general invitation, it's also the actual, the expectation. And that might seem daunting and impossible even. But the reason why it's daunting and impossible is usually because we have a lot of distortion around it. We have a lot of triangles around it. And once we drive through those triangles and we understand maybe more clearly what the actual principles are, it, it, it comes within reach. It comes within the possibility of, of possessing those experiences and blessings. So yeah, it makes me think about people that leave the church without knowing this. Like if I had any plea for, um, especially maybe these young kids that are leaving is like, don't leave until you've like further, like, like really investigated this because this is the gospel and it's so exciting. And, um, and I'm always sad when someone leaves prematurely, I guess, for lack of a better word, because if you can understand these like core principles of what the gospel truly is, instead of just feeling like you have to sit around and be and wait to be told what to do or what to believe or 
or how your prayers can be answered from somebody, whether that be bishop or state president or prophet, like you can receive everything through the Lord. Like that's so exciting. Yeah. It's the good news. It's the good news of the gospel. It is the good news. It's so good. It's so good when you get a view for this and it gives you hope. And and every time you have a one level, every level of testimony you receive actually increases your hope. And I think that's why a lot of people do leave is because they don't have hope or they believe that what they've obtained is like, is it? Uh, and it doesn't fulfill them. There's a hungering. Yeah. So when you have a flat. testimony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a testimony of Christ and you don't move into full and complete repentance that gives you the, gives you an experience of coming born again, then that, that'll bleed off over time and you'll lose connection. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you receive the remission of your sins and you don't, move forward in that learning the principles of how to obtain the more sure word of prophecy then you'll also bleed off there too or you go what nephi and lehi identify as um forbidden paths like you'll get let mm -hmm. off so, so yeah. it's really it's really core to like understand every level of this and um the scriptures thankfully give us a lot of guidance so this is let's let's jump back into joseph smith because he you know he gives us a lot on this topic says the other comforter, meaning the second comforter, is a subject of great interest and perhaps understood by few of this generation. After a person has faith in Christ, okay, so here we go, testimony of Christ, mm -hmm. repents of his sins and is baptized for the remission of his sins and receives the Holy Ghost. There's the testimony of the remission of sins, which is the first comforter. Then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, son, thou shalt be exalted. Calling an election. Yeah. You know, this process doesn't have to be, you don't have to be 80 years old or a, an LDS superhero. You know, spirituality is not a talent. A spirituality is understanding how to obtain covenant from, from God and and hopefully hopefully this is helpful for people along their path so Joseph Smith continues now what is this other comforter it is no more nor less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself and this is the sum and substance of the whole matter that when any man obtains this last comforter he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him or appear unto him from time to time and even he will manifest the father unto him and they will take up their abode with him, and the visions of the heavens will be opened unto him, and the Lord will teach him face to face, and he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And this is the state and place the ancient saints arrived at when they had such glorious visions, Isaiah, Ezekiel, John upon the Isle of Patmos, St. Paul in the three heavens, and all the saints who held communion with the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Mm -hmm. So hopefully the listener will make a lot of connections. We'll see a lot of things come up over and over. Church of the Firstborn. You know, that's not like a, a brick a brick and mortal church. A church of the firstborn is a covenant structure of having the testimony of the fullness of Christ in your salvation. Um, we're going to talk a lot about that in other presentations, but we're kind of introducing it here. So becoming a prophet is actually the path of exaltation. It's not just something that a few of us get or some, some church leaders get to become, but becoming a prophet is actually the path of your own exaltation. You must become a prophet in all these dimensions. This is why Moses says, envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets. And this is, and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Um, this is, the central invitation of the fullness of the gospel, that you all become prophets. Joseph said, no man is a minister of Jesus Christ without being a prophet. No man can be the minister of Jesus Christ, except he has the testimony of Jesus. And this is the spirit of prophecy. Whenever salvation has been administered, it has been by testimony. We're going to talk about that quite a bit here in another presentation. Men at the present time testify of heaven and hell and have neither seen either. And I will say that no man knows these things without this.
this is a funny quote because I'm just pointing this out because he's he's actually referring to the the other churches, other religionists of his time, who they cry out and say, "Oh, I have the testimony of Jesus and I have the Spirit of God," but away with you, Joseph Smith, because Joseph says he's a prophet, but there are to be no prophets or revelators in the last days. And Joseph's response is, "Stop, sir! The revelator, meaning John." The revelator says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So by your own mouth, you are condemned. So the testimony of Jesus is unto all of those who have the spirit of prophecy and they become prophets. And this is the point that Joseph Smith is putting a big exclamation mark on. Okay, let's get into some Brigham Young because Brigham is, boy, he couldn't be clear on this. And he pulls out principles that might shake us if we don't understand the context in which we should understand all of this. So, Joseph, so Brigham says, is being a prophet the privilege of every person? It is. Permit me to remark here, this very people called Latter-day Saints have got to be brought to the spot where they will be trained, if they have not been there already, where they'll humble themselves, work righteousness, glorify God, and keep his commandments. If they have not undivided feelings, they will be chastised until they have them. Not only until every one of them shall see for themselves and prophesy for themselves, have visions to themselves, but to be made acquainted with all the principles and laws necessary for them to know so as to supersede the necessity of anybody teaching them. This is the idea that you receive and obtain the independence of heaven, that the Lord will pour his knowledge upon you to the degree that you pursue him. And the principle of a prophet of somebody who knows more than you is very, very powerful because they can give you a pattern and a testimony that brings you into a higher structure. But the invitation is that we all receive a fullness of the revelations from God that he can pour out of, among us. Does that, does that kind of make sense? It's a, yeah, it's an amazing quote. Holy cow. I've yeah, never seen incredible. that quote. Yeah. Here's another Brigham Young. My knowledge is, if you will follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and his apostles, as recorded in the New Testament, every man and woman will be put in possession of the Holy Ghost. Every person will become a prophet, seer, and revelator, and an expounder of truth. They will know things that are, that will be, and that have been. They will understand things in heaven, things on the earth, and things under the earth, things of time and things of eternity, according to their several callings and capacities. Wow. Like climb up the mountain, come up the mountain, right? Yeah. Yes. So good. Here's Joseph. Back to Joseph. The brethren in Kirtland pray for you unceasingly. This is a letter I think he's sending to W.W. Phelps, if I remember right. The brethren in Kirtland pray for you unceasingly. For knowing the terrors of the Lord, they greatly fear for you. You will see that the Lord command, commanded us in Kirtland to build a house of God and establish a school for the prophets. This is the word of the Lord to us. We must, yea, the Lord helping us, we will obey. As on conditions of our obedience, he has promised us great things. Yea, even a visit from the heavens to honor us with his own presence. We greatly fear before the Lord, lest we should fail of this great honor, which our master proposes to confer on us. We are seeking for humility and great faith, lest we be ashamed in his presence. Now, the school of the prophets was established not for like the school of top leadership, even though the top leadership were in it. It was a school that he was bringing all who would be endowed into this, what he would call the school of the prophets. And when he calls it the school of the prophets, that's what he means in the way that we're using the term, that you receive and obtain the fullness of the knowledge of God. And so this school, which I believe eventually becomes generally what the concept of the temple is and the endowment. There's more to it than that. I don't want to oversimplify it, but is to establish a school for the prophets, a school that you obtain the knowledge to obtain these blessings. And you could see what Joseph had anticipated in terms of spiritual manifestations in that school. Back to Brigham. Perhaps it may make some of you stumble were I to ask you a question. Does a man's being a prophet in this church prove that he shall be the president of it? I answer no. A man may be a prophet, seer, and revelator, and it may have nothing to do with his being the president of the church. So again, we're drawing a distinction between a priesthood office 
and the gifts of prophecy, seership, and revelation. We're going to talk wow. about this a lot more. It's really good, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm going to read from verse 5. And this is in DNC 76. And Kristen, if I were to ask you, like, you know, what is DNC 76 for? I imagine you might jump in and say, this is the three degrees of glory. Like, that's, you know, that's what we read about. Yeah. Yeah. Son of salvation. Mm hmm. It's an extraordinary section um, because it's so powerful with the three degrees of glory. It's rare that I've personally ever heard someone reference the beginning and the end of the section. So like the non vision part of it. And um, one way to understand this is it's sort of like a preamble and then it's the end of it. So it's like the bookends of this revelation. And mm. it may be one of the most powerful scriptures that we have in all of our latter-day revealed scripture and it, i never hear it get quoted which is really um, unfortunate because it might be some of the best so i'm going to read verses five through seven and then we'll jump into eight okay okay so for thus saith the lord i the lord am merciful and gracious unto those who fear me and delight to honor those who serve me in righteousness and in truth great shall be their reward and eternal shall be their glory and to them will I reveal all mysteries, yea, all the hidden mysteries of my kingdom from days of old for ages to come. Will I make known unto them the good pleasure of my will concerning all things pertaining to my kingdom. Okay. Now we'll start with eight. Yea, even the wonders of eternity shall they know, and things to come will I show them, even the things of many generations. And their wisdom shall be great and their understanding reach to heaven, and before them the wisdom of the wise shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent shall come to naught. For by my spirit will I enlighten them, and by my power will I make known unto them the secrets of my will. Yea, even those things which eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor yet entered into the heart of man. So this is the promise that he gives to all people who come to him. Okay. Sounds like the spirit of prophecy. Yeah. Or the gift then of prophecy. We jump, yeah. It is. And it's so beyond just giving a prophecy of the future. The spirit of prophecy is to have the knowledge of God and the knowledge of redemption and, and mm -hmm. to know all things that he's willing to pour out into your heart and into your mind. Then we jump to the end of section 76 where he concludes this thought, this, this principle. But great and marvelous are the works of the Lord and the mysteries of his kingdom, which he showed unto us, which surpass all understanding in glory and in might and in dominion, which he commanded us we should not write while we were yet in the spirit and are not lawful for man to utter. Neither is man capable to make them known, for they are only to be seen and understood by the power of the Holy Spirit, which God bestows on those who love him and purify themselves before him. To whom he grants this privilege of seeing and knowing for themselves. That through the power and manifestation of the spirit, while in the flesh, they may be able to bear his presence in the world of glory. Wow. Now, this is in our, a summary of the greatest blessing and promise and invitation that the Lord gives us in this final dispensation through the revelations of the prophet Joseph Smith. The invitation of the restored gospel and the invitation of the fullness of the gospel is to obtain a testimony of Christ, to know how to receive a fullness of the remission of your sins, and then how to seek Christ to receive a fullness of his presence and the great and precious promises that he gives upon all people who seek him diligently. This is the great invitation, Kristen, that we are to become prophets. We are to become living witnesses of Christ. We're to become examples of patterns of how to obtain the knowledge of God, and most importantly, the knowledge and pattern of how to be redeemed. 
in this world. And it's so powerful. Mm, yeah, this is the stuff that my soul just goes on fire with. You know, it just um, makes the gospel just feel alive and purposeful and, I don't know, exhilarating. I mean, it's just amazing to think of it in this way and to know of it in this way that there is an invitation beyond anything I could have comprehended but once i've started to like entertain this and be introduced to this over the years um i I could never leave this gospel like this is my this is my life's work (laughs) my deepest desire um i just love it oh so awesome and it never gets old like i'm i'm on fire right now just watching this and be in you know remembering that this is what it's all about it's awesome yeah it it does stir your soul because it gives you hope and it gives you an invitation that's so beyond um oftentimes what we think is possible so now that we've sort of established this principle of what we are to experience and what we can experience we we're going to unwrap in their next presentation what it means to follow the prophet which becomes so much better than what we normally think. It's so enlightening. It's so helpful. And we're going to go ahead and address that next. So thank you for this. And we're grateful for the gospel in Christ and the Holy Spirit and hope that the listener was able to perhaps enjoy some of the word of the Lord through this presentation. So we'll see you next time.